thank you all for joining our webinar today. My name is Timea Bayro, and I am part of the RDA Ireland team who is organizing the Meet the Expert lectures, who are now um, a series of webinars. I will just highlight a few logistics points before I pass on to our moderator today, Dr. Natalie Harrower, and to our speaker, of course, Dr. Connor O'Carroll. First of all, please note that we are recording this session and we will make sure that the recording will be made available online over the upcoming days on the RDA website, so on the webinar page. Note also that by default you are in listen-only mode. We kindly ask you to um, ask any questions that you might have by using the, the question box that you have in your control panel. Uh, you may do so throughout the, throughout the webinar as we have a component dedicated to Q&As and we will be addressing the questions as they come in. Uh, we also welcome any feedback that you might have on the tool, on the webinar tool that we are using. Note that you have a, a flexibility on the layout of, uh, of, of your screen so you can see the presentation as well as the, the speaker throughout the, throughout the webinar. Do let us know if you have any suggestions on this. So without further ado, I'll pass on the audio to uh, Natalie Harrower, who is going to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this. Um, I'd like to first start with a warm welcome to our speaker and to all of you. Um, it's afternoon here in Dublin, but there could be people joining from all over the place. So perhaps good morning, good middle of the night, whatever time you're finding us at here. Um, this is our sixth talk for the Research Data uh, Ireland node in the Meet the Expert series, where, um, as it says on the tin, we invite uh, experts in fields that relate to open science and data sharing um, and other uh, connected issues to, um, to share with us the work that they do or their perspectives on the topic. Now, it's the sixth talk in that series, but it is the first one that we are offering online. Um, you may guess why that's the situation. And I just wanted to thank uh, Connor O'Carroll for being so accommodating in shifting what was going to be an in-person talk in the lovely seminar of the National Library with the fantastic sandwiches that are offered there um, to instead giving us a, an online talk. The nice thing is that um, we can have more people uh, joining us here today than we would normally have. So we'll take this as a, a positive thing in the moment. Um, I think also this is a very curious moment for open science. Um, a lot of us have been working in this area for some time, but the COVID-19 pandemic seems to be pushing uh, the understanding of the importance of open science more into the mainstream. So, you know, the media are talking about data sharing, um, the need for speed, for accuracy, for efficiency and for openness. Um, so let's hope that this understanding um, and support for the uh, principles and the efforts of open science are, uh, continues um, and hopefully the pandemic doesn't continue. <laughs> So anyway, on to the introductions. We're very pleased to have Dr. O'Carroll with us today. Um, he's going to, he, he has the ability to provide us with a very wide picture of open science and what that supports um, and what supports are required to make it a reality as well. Dr. O'Carroll is an independent consultant on research and higher education policy and funding. He also has extensive experience working with the Irish higher education sector and funding agencies at European and national levels here in Ireland, uh, such as the Marie Sklodowska Curie Programme, Enterprise Ireland and Science Foundation Ireland. Uh, in addition to the higher education sector and funding agencies, he's also worked extensively with government departments and industry. So um, he's what we could call a quadruple threat. Um, he has experience in, in all of these areas that uh, are key to bringing open science together. He's been involved in policy formulation, at various levels, um, having worked in the European Commission's DG research and with the Irish Science Policy Advisory Agency for FAS. Um, and he's also, he was also the chair of two European Commission working groups and editor of the subsequent documents that uh, came out of that. And they're very key ones for the topic of open science. Um, one was rewards uh, and incentives under open science and the other was on open science skills. So. Um, not just the brass tacks of open science, but also the, the key elements that are required to support it. So he, as I said, he has a very broad perspective. So I'm about to turn it over to Connor now. 
Um, uh, but I will remind you to use the question function. There's a question and a chat on GoToWebinar. Stick with the question one so everything's in one place. And um, at the end of his talk, um, I'll come back and uh, kind of read out those questions uh, so that he can respond to them. Okay, so pass it over to you, Connor. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalie, for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everybody, to what is becoming pretty much commonplace at the moment to be sitting at home looking into a screen and um, and trying to connect with lots of people around the world and around Europe. I mean, there, there, there are plus sides. One does lose. It is, I haven't actually experienced the sandwiches, so I'm, I'll hope that, that, uh, that that's something for a later date. Um, Natalie, thank you very much for the for the introduction. And I think that um, one of the things, yes, I was involved in open science on two expert groups for the commission on skills and training for, for researchers in open science, and also on uh, rewards and incentives for researchers doing and practicing open science. But in addition to that, I publish myself, I'm a researcher. And um, one of the things which in fact infuria ha has in still infuriates me is that um, my, my original uh, discipline was in physics and mathematics and I find that um, papers I published, I, if I want to read them now, I'd have to pay maybe $30 just to get access to them. Uh, that is, that's pretty annoying unless you, unless you have you know, your own hard copy in that. And, uh, but the good thing now is that, and I've seen, and, and I'm going to come back to that more in, in the presentation, is that more and more there's greater opportunities for publishing, for researchers to publish in an open in an open environment and a high quality open environment. So for example, I was involved in a conference uh, on the doctorate last September in Hanover, and uh, we're producing a book from that, but we're gonna publish it on um, University College London Press, which is a very recent um, publishing house from UCL and it's open access. And it means our, our book, once it's published, it'll be open online, free to download for everybody. And that's the way things should be. I mean, you want to disseminate information globally in every sense. And what I want to talk about today is, um, is really very much in the European environment and um, open science policy practice in Europe. And more importantly now, like what's going to happen next and where is it going and what way is it going to develop in, in coming years? And I think that um, just moving on to the first slide here, I mean, I'll put up that definition there of open science. It's, um, it's a definition which, uh, which I think you're all probably pretty familiar with anybody who is working in this field in a way that um, one can collaborate and share information and data, research processes, et cetera, for the reuse, re redistribution and reproduction of research in its underlying data. And, and I remember that that last sentence is rather important because the one of the issues in science itself has been the, the, the plethora of publications that have emerged in the last 15, 20 years. And what this means is that um, the, the ability of scientists to keep up, to follow, but more importantly, to read other papers and reproduce their information has become more and more and more challenging. It can also waste an awful lot of time, people going out and reproducing, trying to reproduce data, trying to reproduce experiments, where the information is not there, at least the full information is not there for them. So that's a, it, it is, uh, but I think I think the Foster definition for me now is is, is uh, the, the one I would use in any in any context. And what do I mean by open science? Well, again, just looking at this matrix here of um, of different of um, of different aspects, it's open access, which many people are familiar with, and open data, but also open education, citizen science. And this is not, a, there's often a mistaken belief that citizen science is something about outreach and that and engagement. No, this is really about, it's about engaging civilians, citizens in research itself. And probably the one area which has been quite successful and much to the fore in this is actually uh, patients in health research. I'm involved with the Irish Health Research Forum and the Irish Medical Char Charities. And many of those organizations have patients who are key parts of defining, not, not just not just being part of surveys or answering questions or giving opinions, but actually being part of the, the process of defining the questions that should be asked by researchers in the research process itself. So it's a much, much broader concept. 
open evaluation and open peer review. This is something which again is, um, is, is a core aspect of open science, probably not as well known, and something which again is proven controversial because of the ability of researchers or the willingness of researchers for their comments and that to be published openly when they're commenting on other people's papers. Open source, open hardware, open licensing, all of those aspects. But if I just move on to our next slide, this, I think this is a good question. And this is my, my colleague and uh, friend, Gareth O'Neill. Gareth works at the University of Leiden and also Technopolis. Um, he is a, he's currently an ambassador for open science in Plan S. And um, I, I like this, I, I, I like this one here because we've all said it to our kids that sharing is caring. Well, these are, these are good reasons to do open science. It opens access to research. It increases discovery, increases social. It facilitates reproducibility, which is something I've already mentioned. And it can be so effective when you share information and share research with others, because you can actually bring about change. You can bring about real change. And this is, um, I mean, th th this is nowhere more evident than as Natalie mentioned earlier on with COVID-19 and the pandemic. Now this site, many of you I'm sure are well familiar with, this is the John Hopkins uh, Coronavirus Resource Centre. And I came across this way back at the beginning in January, just after it was launched. And uh, of course it was a very different picture then because that picture then, instead of showing the globe, it only showed China and a few little plate dots around it. And, uh, and the numbers were rather small. But um, as you can see over time, they have grown and grown into much larger amounts. But what's most important here has been the sharing of data and information. And one of the first things that was done, I don't know if you're aware, but the, the some of the, the Chinese scientists who were involved, they sequenced the genome, they, they sequenced the coronavirus genome, and uh, they shared it immediately. They made it open to all other researchers globally. So they could access that information immediately in terms of their own research. And that's been really helpful for, for people to work on and looking at, looking at possibilities of, um, of um, vaccines and other ways of, at least arresting or slowing down the, the spread of the virus itself. The, yes, and this, and, and this I thought was very interesting here. This, this, some of you may be well aware of this, <clears throat> excuse me, as this is uh, related to the Research Data Alliance. And um, this, these are guidelines and recommendations that were published, that was I think on Friday. And it was having over 400 people around the world working on this in terms of producing guidelines and recommendations in this field. And that's, that, that, that is really, really valuable because often what you can find in science is you're working in parallel. But you're not working on the same base. You're using different guidelines, different methodologies, and trying to bring something together in this unified manner is so effective. And it does show how something like that can actually bring out the best and be a good example. And I think this is going to be a very good example to push at politicians and that about the, the, the validity and the value of open science itself. But I also want to um, I, I also want to go back a little bit to the origins of open science because there's an assumption that this is very much a, a modern day phenomenon. Well, first of all, it's not because subjects, a number of subjects have been engaged in open science for many, many years, especially in terms of sharing data. And I want to go right back to the 16th century. And um, two, two figures, uh, certainly Johannes Kepler, you're probably all very familiar with, maybe less so with Tycho Brahe, who was a Danish astronomer. Now, this was a very interesting situation. Tycho as, um, was a very well-known astronomer in Denmark. In fact, he was, he was favored by the, by the king of Denmark at the time, who gave him his own island to build his own observatory. And not only did he own the island, but he effectively owned all the people that lived on it. They were, they were effectively his vassals for the period that he, he, was, he was on that island. He built a very advanced astronomical observatory. And uh, he, it was the last observatory of a type which did not use telescopes, it used the naked eye. But he was very good, and he had very good instrumentation, very large instruments, in fact, to get accuracy. And at that time, he was the go-to person for data. He had all the key astronomical data in terms of stars, in terms of the motion of planets. And um, unfortunately for him, um, the King of Denmark died. And his son was less, um, let's say, was, was, um, was less interested in this guy who had an island to himself, was being well funded by the court and was uh, just producing data, which of no, was of no particular interest to the, to, to, the, to the son of the original king. 
So he left and he moved to Prague. It was the seat of the Holy Roman Emperor. And um, it just so happened that around the same time, Johannes Kepler arrived in Prague and he was he had he had left um, he had left Graz at the time where he was teaching, but he was he was having trouble because he was a Lutheran and uh, Graz was very much Catholic. But anyway, Kepler wanted Tycho's data and he wanted his data because he had some ideas about the motion of planets, but he couldn't prove it. He couldn't do it without data. He needed that information to show that what subsequently became the three, three laws of Kepler and which laid the basis for Newtonian gravity. But um, unfortunately for Tycho anyway, Kepler was with him for just over a year and at the end of that time Tycho died in which are still considered suspicious circumstances. In fact, some believe that uh, Kepler may have had a hand in this. It's, it's debatable, it's hard to prove one way or the other. But um, as a result of that, he eventually got his hands on his data, of course, and was able to develop the three laws of motion. But that, Tycho was a bit of an outlier because one of the things at that period was that people did share their data. They did send letters to one another and show what they had, show the results and that in a very open manner. And uh, it was something which, when you when you look, and this this persisted over over the following centuries. If you look at scientists around Europe and indeed globally, people did share their information and data. It was actually really with the onset of the publishing industry where this changed, and it has turned the system around into a very closed system. Luckily, now we are moving back towards openness, which I think is the, is is the uh, is the only way to go. But what I wanted to, as, 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 as is clear from the title of the talk, is um, looking at this in a European context, and most importantly, in terms of, well, what is European policy in this area? Well, for research, I mean, many of you are familiar with the, um, the, the European framework programmes, current, the current Horizon 2020 and the forthcoming Horizon Europe. But behind that, there is a very, very clear European policy known as the European Research Area, which was only really established in the year 2000. And it was the idea of Europe as an open market for the free movement of knowledge and people. And this brought about in 2003 a target for spending 3% of every country, and the average across Europe of the spend of, on research will be about 3% of GDP. Now, the target was originally 2010, it was pushed back again and again, it's still there as a target. And in 2009, something rather important happened that this, this aspiration, let's say, this European aspirational policy became legal. It was actually enshrined in the Lisbon, in the Lisbon Treaty. We should know about it. We voted on it twice uh, before we decided to accept it. And it's, um, I think it's Article 159 of the treaty, but it, it, um, it established that this is now the policy of Europe, of the free movement of knowledge and people across the, Europe, across the European member states. And that this will be implemented, and this is most important because the framework programmes before that, the funding programmes, they were there to, to get greater collaborative effort across Europe, to build greater capacity, to deal with big issues that no single member state could deal with on their own. But now, they were clearly defined as the implementation tool of the res European research area itself. Now, in terms of actually specific policies, I mean, what are the specific policies of the European research area? It's all very fine to say an open market for the free movement of knowledge and people, but how do you, how do you define that in a more concrete way that will allow you then to take very specific actions in that regard? Well, there was a number of variations of this, but in 2012, there was an agreement that it would be defined under five different under five different headings. That a European research area needed more effective national research systems, and what this meant was more better functioning research funding agencies, and working in a, in a generally collaborative ma manner, having optimal transnational cooperation and competition. And this was, an, in terms of transnational cooperation, this meant trying to set common research agendas. At the moment, the common research agenda at a European level are the Sustainable Development Goals and the concept of the greening of Europe. So it's a very clear common purpose. While it might be implemented differently in individual countries, that this idea of having something common that we all work together on.
The next three elements of it out of the five is an open labour market for researchers. And this has always been a key issue to open up the European system for the movement of researchers in terms of career development, but not just their, their movement, but also the career development of better research opportunities for people, better career opportunities for researchers. And this is particularly the case given the fact that most of people who come through a PhD in a postdoctoral cycle will not become academics, that they will find, they'll find employment elsewhere. Gender equality and gender mainstreaming in research. And finally, this one here, optimal circulation, access to and transfer of scientific knowledge, including via digital formats. This was in fact, this was done back in 2012 before the word open science was even used in the, in the European context. So it was actually there, it was, it was hiding a bit, let's say, it wasn't brought to the fore. This all changed in 2015, where the then commissioner, I mean, the, 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 other, the, the other ones remained, the five ones remained of, um, from, the, from, the, from the original concept of the, of the era. But the new policy was to put a very clear focus on open science, open innovation, and open to the world. The open to the world being more in terms of open international collaboration. And that really has been, was the genesis of the changes in European policy, of, of formalizing even more so. Open access was already in framework seven in that program and in Horizon 2020. But now there was the focus on open data and the, and the European Commission taking a much more active role in terms of pushing forward the open science agenda. And that was the basis of the key issues are the development of these EU open science agenda of having eight key issues. And these were, as you can see from, from this here, of the reward and incentive systems of how do you, I mean, this, this is a big issue in open science, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in detail, is that how do you motivate people to do it? How do you motivate people to become open, to publish their data? to publish in open access journals, especially when the journals that give them the high impact, the journals which will secure them a job, are nature, science, cell, whatever, whatever discipline you're in, and they are not open access, they are closed. So how do you motivate people in this? And, as, and, and, and linked to that then is how do you measure quality and impact in an open environment? If, you've, if, if, if you're working with open access journals, if you're sharing data, how do you measure the quality and impact of these things? Otherwise known as, I mean, as, 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 as the, the, the common term has been to use altmetrics. And one of the downside of altmetrics is that the people who, who want to maintain the old system is that they will say, oh, altmetrics, what do you mean? Is that just people referring to how many Twitter hits they had? Or how many people like them on Facebook? Well, it's a lot more than that, but that's an easy way out for some people. Although I must say, if you look at the uh, one thing I find interesting is that if 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 you, if you do want to see something in altmetrics, there's um there's a very good uh, public thing they do every year is they 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 list the top hundred publications under altmetrics from the previous year, and it's quite fascinating because some of the publications are from very very different disciplines and different areas would normally imagine. They're high impact, but not necessarily in the way you would normally you would normally think of. What is the future of scholarly publishing? Because it's all very well for people to rail against Elsevier and Springer, but they are big, well-funded, well-organized corporations. But what about the smaller societies in across all disciplines who are actually um, would struggle in an open environment or could struggle in an open environment? Although I don't include all of them, some of them, some of them like the American Chemical Society are extremely well-funded and well-endowed. But it is to look at how do you how do you balance this? How do you ensure that scholarly publishing does not is, is not negatively impacted in this way? Of having fair and open data. People had spoke about open data for a long time, but it was very clear coming through European policy discussions was that what you needed was fair. In other words, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible data. And that has become now the watchword in looking forward to Horizon Europe, to the next framework program, where the data may not always be open, but it has to be fair data to begin with. And then one uses the, um, the strap line as open 
as, as, as open as possible and as closed as necessary. The European Open Science Cloud to set up and is underway is that the EOSC is, is well underway in terms of trying to define structures in place that have a common towards common goals of how you store data at a European level with common formats, common methodologies, etc. And this next one is something which sometimes um, jars with people's view of open science, of research integrity. But in fact, research integrity is core to open science because if you practice science in an open manner in terms of how you publish your data, how you publish your data, how you publish your research results, it's actually a driver of integrity because being open means that others can access your data. They can check your results. They can go back and see, can they arrive at the same results? It's actually a, real, a really strong driver of research integrity itself. And the two are very, very closely interlinked. The next one again, and this is, a, this is a core part of openness, is citizen science, of opening science outside the walls of universities and research centres and engaging much, much more so with citizens. And this is not just about, as I mentioned before, it's not just about outreach, it's not just about being nice to citizens and getting them engaged, it's also about building trust and engaging people in the scientific process, in the whole concept of questioning of understanding, and this is something which comes up again and again, if you, I, I'm sure you're all well aware, where people will say, oh, these scientists, they never know what they mean. They, they say, one says yes, one say no. With COVID-19, should some people say we should wear masks? Other people say we shouldn't. The Czech Republic, is the, it's, it's obligatory to wear a mask. So the citizen, the ordinary person looks at, can these people not make up their minds? But the concept of citizen science is to engage people further so they understand the complexities, that there are often not black and white answers. They may well be in engineering and physics, but when you come to other disciplines, even like this in medicine, it is not always a black and white answer. And finally, open education and skills, because you cannot have open science without open education, and indeed skills for the people practicing open science, skills for the researchers, practicing open science, skills for the other professionals involved in open science as well in universities and research centres. So these are the, the, the eight key issues that the European Commission has been working on for the last number of years. And indeed, not, they're not the only organisations. There are many others across Europe working on that, but they've certainly put a great deal of focus on this. There's been, there's been the Open Science Policy Platform, which has produced its own recommendations in this area. What I would like to focus on for a moment is one specific aspect, excuse me. I just want to look at open science for the moment from the perspective of the researcher, of what their needs are. And I mentioned this already here about the recognition for practicing open science. What are the, the incentives for them to do it? Well, the incentives are that in order for this to work, you need funding agents to change their evaluation criteria. You need universities to change their recruitment criteria and their career progression criteria. You cannot simply say that somebody has a publications in nature or publications, whatever is the flavor of the month in terms of high impact journals, that that's enough to get them a job or to give them a research grant, because that is not open science and it is not it is no incentive for anybody to do open science particularly for younger researchers because they look and say well if i want to make my career oh yes it's great if i go off and publish in, in, in the good open access journals in my discipline but if i don't publish in nature i don't publish in cell or whatever then i won't get a job and the rewards must be the rewards must be that by practicing open science you will be recruited you will get a job that you will see that this is part of helping your career to progress and it will help you get funding. The other aspect of what researchers need in open science is actually access to skills, training for open science. And when I put in brackets there, OR1 to OR4, this is researchers at all career level, from PhD at OR1 to postdoc OR2 to emerging 
sort of independent researchers at OR3 to more senior researchers at level OR4. And I do mention very importantly related professionals, because if you want people engaged as data stewards, if you want people engaged as in, in technical areas, then they need the same skills as well. I would emphasize too that in terms of skills that they don't need to become experts in everything, but they need to understand how to, for example, prepare their data to be placed in an open format. The skills here, and this is the list of the various skills, the skills and expertise for open access publishing, this is often forgot about. If you want to publish in open access, you have to know how to do it. The skills for expertise regarding research data. Again, you don't have to be an expert in so-called big data, but you do need to understand how your data is prepared and presented for that. My, my analogy is always as a physicist that if you want to, you don't need to know how, how the electron microscope works. You don't need to, well, you do need to know how it works, at least in principle, but you don't need, you don't need to be the person that has to be able to work it itself. You do need to know how to prepare your samples to put into the microscope for that. And similarly, you do need to know how to prepare your data. The skills and expertise to work outside one's own disciplines. The skills to engage pro professional research conduct. Legal skills, I want to say about legal, I mean, you don't have to become a legal expert, but you do need to understand that if you're going to publish data openly, then what are the legal aspects of this? Who has the rights to that data? Are you infringing on anybody's rights? Is this part of a partnership with other institutions with commercial interests? Do you have personal data, health data of individuals that might be compromised if you publish it? It's to understand all of these things. Again, you don't need to be the expert, it's to be able to ask the questions. And finally, there are the skills for citizen science, the skills for researchers to work with citizens, to speak English to them rather than um, in, um, in, in, in common research acronyms and parlance and to be able to work with citizens and listen to them in terms of setting research questions. The next point I want to go on to, and I mentioned this is about um, rewards and incentives for researchers. Well, and this focuses on career assessment. As I mentioned to you before, in fact, in 2011, the European Framework for Researcher Careers classified researchers in four broad categories as first stage PhD, recognized researchers, effectively a postdoc, established researchers somewhere between an emerging junior lecturer at that kind of level, and people who are then leading researchers. Because you need different things for different people. If you're looking at skills, for example, and for the moment anyway, there's, there, there are some there's some pretty good delivery of skills courses available for people at first stage. I mean, through various different platforms, through Foster and Spark and that, that, that there are various different way, way, ways of accessing that. But remember, you also need, it's not enough to have your PhDs learning about open science and having those skills. You need your professors to have the same and you need them to take leadership in this area. But they're critical in doing this as well. There's no point if your students know how to do it or your, or your postdocs. If, if, the person run, if the person in charge of the lab or, or the research team is not interested, it's not going to happen. And when we come to assessment of researchers, I like to give this example here. It's a bit of a, it takes a moment to look at it, but it's by a colleague, Bernard Rentier, who is the former rector of the University of Liège, who introduced full open, openness in that university. And himself and a colleague did some work on Nature magazine. And they call this the impact factor deception, because what they looked at was they looked at articles published in Nature magazine between 2012 and 2013. And there were, there were as you can see from the graph there, there were 1,944 articles published. Then, in 2014, they were looking at, well, the impact factor was 41.4 for nature. So, you know, you, get, you publish in nature, you're going to get a very, very high impact factor. It's going to look great on your CV. But when they started looking at who was reading these papers and who was citing them, what they found was that only, three, only 75 of those 
1,944 papers provide 25% of the journal's citations. So many of the papers were hardly being read or being cited. Now, of course, it is a difficult art journal to get into, but nonetheless, it, um, it did go to show that just because you're there doesn't mean, you're that, doesn't mean that, that what you've done is actually that great. And just as an, uh, just an interesting thing I read last week in Physics World, a physics magazine, was that um, a study was done recently between, and they looked at the Nobel Prizes between 1985 and, um, and last year. And they found that hardly any of them had published in the so-called high impact journals. The Nobel Prize winners had published in what might be considered somewhat obscure journals. So just, just because you publish in Nature doesn't mean your research is Nobel Prize winning. Sure, it's going to be, should be good, but it's not guaranteed. But it becomes then completely distorted if you pervert the system by saying, we well, give it a big high impact factor, that means it's great, that means you get a job. That is not really the way to do science. And what has, what has been developed at a European level to look at career assessment of people is the Open Science Career Assessment Matrix. And this is opening out the whole idea of how you assess somebody's career. In terms of research output, look at their research activity, their publications, their data sets, their open source, their funding, to really expand out what you're looking at. What about the research process in terms of citizen science and stakeholder engagement? of collaboration and interdisciplinarity, of research integrity, of risk management, of service and leadership in terms of what you have done, practiced as a researcher in terms of peer review or academic standing, in terms of impact, in terms of teaching and supervision and professional experience. This suddenly has taken it from that very narrow impact factor and exploded it out into all of the different things which people do on a day-to-day -day basis to recognize them further. And this is probably a more, this is looking at it in a matrix format and just pointing out that some of the aspects will change according to career level. So if you're looking at research output, you're going to expect something significant, let's say, very high at your leadership level. Whereas for people at PhD level, you're not going to expect a high level of research output at that stage. So you will look for different aspects at different times in people's careers. So it's not a, sing it's not a single way of, of assessing somebody. It's not, a, it's, it, it's not a one size fits all. You have to tailor it for the job and for the type of, 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 of career track you are looking at. If you're looking at somebody who you're expecting to have more engagement with industry and doing patents and that, then you want that. You want to see the research impact looking at patents and, and things in terms of their career. So, you, you, you change the way that you look at um, a career assessment. This has been, in fact, it's interesting now that a number of, um, of universities are, are working on this. The University of Ghent in Belgium has actually adopted this as it means for recruiting new staff and for progressing new staff as well. The medical faculty in Utrecht University in the Netherlands is, is doing exactly the same. Um, the, the European Commission itself is looking at this in terms of Horizon 2020, of how, not so much how to mainstream it yet, but to pilot it. How do you pilot this in grant funding? And as you know, one of, the, one, of, one, of the, one of the valuable things in that format is that if the Commission do it for their funding streams, then others do follow. National funders do follow this trend. They will take on that and say, well, we should, we should do something pretty similar. And of course, in all of this, What's core here is in terms of research output, research process. These are all done in open science context, not closed, but open. However, one's got to look at this in the context, again, back to the individual researcher. What is the challenge to researchers moving to an open science, to becoming open scientists or open researchers? Well, right now, if you look at it, for researchers at PhD and postdoc level, it's a major challenge to them because they don't want to risk their careers at this point in time. We're at a transition period, we're in a transition period. And 
if they move to say publishing only in open access journals, are they going to get a job? In the current systems we have across Europe and indeed globally, they're not. It's as simple as that. For more established researchers and for leading researchers, it's minor for them. They're, they've they've been there, done that. They can afford to broaden themselves a bit in terms of in terms of what they're doing. That may not diminish their career opportunities. But for but for younger, and um, it is essentially those at first and you know a PhD and postdoc are younger researchers. These are major these are major challenges for them to engage in open science. So it is something, it is a core part of how do you change the system by doing that. But in that as well, one's also got to remember that the key players are not just the, it is not, so, it is not just the funders or the universities, it is actually the, the researchers themselves, the research community itself will play a key role. Because it is the research community that review grants. It is the research community that peer review publications, that sit on editorial boards. They're the ones who can who can make changes and will need to make changes in order to make it, to open up the system for younger researchers to engage in open science. I'm just gonna jump these ones here. Because I, I wanna talk about what's happening next. And what is clear is that for the European research area this year and beyond, there will be a strong focus on open science. At the moment, there, there is a renewal of the European research area. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm actually involved in this in this consultation with the Commission. And what we're doing is we're looking at the European research area. We're looking at developments in all kinds of different areas around interdisciplinarity, open science, um, research, research career progression, et cetera, and seeing, well, what should happen next? I mean, in the open science side, there is no doubt the recommendations are very clear. We press harder and harder and harder for an open science, open research environment. And this will, I mean, this is copper fastened in Horizon Europe, the next framework program, which should start next year in terms of open access publications and open data. And the Commission is very much behind this. And this is really important that, you, that, 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 that there is that push at European level. Now, may, many countries are, well, they're, they're, they're not maybe very strong, they support it. But I think what you find is, and it's surprising that at, um, at the level of, um, in terms of the, the, the funding programmes, Horizon, Horizon Europe, there is a very, very strong impetus. And interestingly enough, it was, um, it's often thought what well, it was the case that the, the three O's, let's say the open science, open innovation, open to the world that came into European policy in 2015. This was the baby of um, Carlos Moedas, the Portuguese uh, commissioner for research at that time. The current commissioner, Maria Gabriel, who is the commissioner for innovation and youth, she, she actually straddles the two areas of education and research. She was formerly the commissioner the digital commissioner. So she is fully behind this. And th that's great because sometimes what happens is when a new commissioner comes in, they sort of cast aside what the previous person did because they want their own agenda. Now, yes, she's developing her own agenda, but at that, at the core of that, there will be open science. And I think that's a that's a very positive thing. I want to look a little bit broader to um to what's a uh, little bit, you know, with even within, but also beyond Europe in terms of open science drivers. And I think, you know, in terms of funding, I've spoken about Horizon Europe, but of course, we've got to talk about Plan S because Plan S is working. Um, I actually, last summer for a period, I was, um, I was in charge of Plan S and it was fascinating to know, <laughs> to suddenly find oneself very popular amongst publishers, to be getting phone calls, to meet people from Springer, to meet people from Nature, to meet people from Elsevier and that. There was, the fact that the funders in Europe, the major funders, and they more and more coming on board, including the European Commission or the European Research Council as part of that, all saying, no, no, we're, we're behind Plan S. We're going to implement it. No longer are we going to talk about aspirations down the road. This is going to happen in 2021, end of story. And, and that is driving change. European policy itself, quality of research, because this comes back to the plethora of publications. The idea of having open data where people can access and reproduce data. 
this this you know it, it it reinforces research integrity it allows people to re-perform experiments to check to be sure that these things are correct they all link to one another so open science drives actually drives quality in that sense in a global sense and just on um, plan s and um you, you may uh, again i mentioned gareth here as well this is his slide i borrowed and he's one of their he's one of their ambassadors for plan s but it's um, deadline is first first of January next year. And what is interesting, I don't know if you've seen this, that Nature's going to join Plan S. They I, they'd indicated that last summer, but now they've made it a public statement. This was just on the 14th of April, or sorry, the 9th of April, and um, that they had um, they're going to join it. And they admit the fact it's going to be hard for them to do it, but they have seen the writing on the wall. They're going to have to change. What they're going to do is, and is that their their scientific publications will become open access. More the, the the type of work that Nature does, and they do really valuable work where they where they work on global data in terms of collaborations, in terms of bibliometrics, and that, and produce produce new work themselves. That's going to be closed. That you're going to have to pay for that. That's that's kind of reasonable. But the actual core science science that they published will become open access. And I thought this was good as well because you're probably aware of um, of um, uh, what, what I mentioned there a moment ago was about um, peer the peer pressure and the need for senior researchers to take action. Well, this is one here from the board of Neuron, which is a very high impact journal by Elsevier, and uh, 79 members of the board have said we want you to go open full open access. Now. This, this is not without precedent because a number of years ago, a, um, a campaign led by a Dutch man, uh, Johan Rurik, who is also an open science uh, plan S ambassador. Um, he was on the, I think he was the editor, the editor in chief of the, of the journal Lingua, uh, which is Elsevier journal. They wanted to go open access. Um, Elsevier refused and they dug their heels and never going to happen. So the entire editorial board resigned and created the new open access online journal, Glossa. Which, has which took over the research community move. Why? Because the editors were the best people in the field. They says, if they go there, we're going to follow them. And this kind of peer pressure is going to be really necessary as well, that it comes from the actual scientific community. Because remember, the scientific community support the journals. They do it for free. The editors, yeah, you, you get taken to some nice conferences and stuff like that, but it's not, but ultimately this stuff, they're not paid. The people who sit down and review articles for journals, write, write critiques and that, and it's a lot of work when you do this, they're not paid. So the publishers actually benefit from free work by academics. And it's good to see that academics themselves and researchers are starting to push back and say, no, we want to go, we want to make these things open access as well. And I think just one of the last points I'd make back to that was that the World Health Organization joined um, Plan S last um i think it was last september they joined and their principle was was that they wanted to ensure that health data was open and free to everybody in the world in every country developed underdeveloped whatever access to resources they have and that's an important aspect that's often forgotten about in open science the, uh, we all think about it in terms of access to other people's data that but you forget about the fact there's whole regions of the world that will never have the funding to buy the journals to buy access to these things online. And that's why open science can be really important as well. Well, challenge is present and future. It's, it's pretty clear that the, 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 at a top level, in a sense, things are going. We're looking, we're, we're seeing things like Plan S and, and the Commission's work as pushing things in that direction. But really, you have to dig down much lower in terms of working with researchers and incentivizing them to do this as well to make it work better. The solutions are policy and funding. I mean, the policy is there and funding. If you if you shift, if you change the direction of funding, if you change how you award funding, then people researchers will follow this. And what you need with that in terms of trans, how do you transform a system is you need legislation, you need uh, you need funding, you need different systems of how you do things, how you um, how you assess researchers' careers, and you need to do this at every level. I mean, I've talked today now about about European and global initiatives, but you also this needs to happen in universities and it is happening in, in, in universities it needs to happen at member state level as well in a concerted manner because without that you will not get 
a that change over time. You will not get that collective change. You might get it in one direction, but you'll have to, unless you, for example, you make all your journals open access, you make data open, but unless you link that with rewards and incentives for individual researchers to actually practice more, to publish more on these things, it will not be successful. But I'm very optimistic at the moment because I see so much happening. And I do think going back to the COVID-19, uh, example is that this is going to show governments what the value of open data is and how you share data, how it can be shared and how valuable it can be in dealing with something like a global pandemic. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Connor. We have a, a number of questions here, so I think we'll just jump right into them if that's good for you. Um, Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so bear with me because um, I'm finding out in the moment that the, the question box is really tiny and I'm going to be squinting. <laughs> so, um, okay, uh, and, and for everyone who's still on the call, which looks like basically everybody we started with, um, you can still add questions using the question box and, um, and I'll get to them in the order that they've come in. Okay, so the first question uh, comes from Daniel Carey, uh, his colleague in NUIG. And he asks, uh, to what extent does the open science concept require open access? Uh, he goes on to say, the slide implies a seamless relationship. Open access seems to me to raise a host of issues that need separate consideration, even if one accepts the good of other open science principles. So specifically, how will we ensure that costs for open publication are not imposed on researchers who have no access to funds? For example, the humanities. We know there is vastly, uh, most of the funding is for STEM research. Um, how about early career scholars, independent scholars, retired academics? No solution has yet been proposed for open access to monographs, which tend to cost 10,000 or more depending on the publisher. Um, so that's rather long, but I guess to, to summarize, uh, the question is, does it require open access and, and how about those very uh, challenging issues within costs and open access? Yeah, I mean, th this is th this is actually a very important issue. The principle, and I think that one always starts with the principle, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. And I've taken on, 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 on two aspects of that, because I think op open access being the default, but there are exceptions. So if, if, if I look at if I look at publications first and disciplines, and this is I mean, this is an issue which is brought up often in the humanities, but it also exists in other, in other scientific disciplines as well, because not all STEM areas are actually well funded at all. There is particular plenty of areas of STEM which, which would not be well funded. And the, 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 one of the recommendations, in fact, I just tell you now that one of the recommendations that, that is going to go to the European Commission that in terms of the next, the next framework program is that cost for open access publications becomes a direct cost. It's no longer something hidden in an indirect cost or somewhere else, it becomes direct. But that still doesn't answer the humanities question. And I think that, uh, I do know that the, um, in terms of Plan S, that the Coalition S are working closely with publishers, especially in the humanities on this particular issue, but not, again, not just those, but also in, let's say, the smaller academic publishers, even in the, even in the STEM areas. The, um, one of the things which, uh, which has been, which, which has been um, hard to deal with with the publishers is that in terms of finding out what are the actual costs of, of publication. Because one of, the, one, of the, one of the things, and I go back to the example I gave you of Johan Rurik and, and moving from the Elsevier Lingua Journal to the Glossa Journal, was that when they did that, they created a business model to see, well, what, you know, what was a reasonable cost as an, as an APC? As an, author, as an author processing charge that would, that would allow them to keep the business running, let's say, not start making the ridiculous profits of Elsevier and those. And they, and, and they came up with a pretty low number within a few hundreds of euro, which were, which were reasonable. I think that um, I don't, I mean, I don't, I, I don't have a simple answer to this. I don't know the details in, 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 in that aspect of it in terms of, the, in terms of publishing and that. But the, thing, the first thing is that at the moment, the system is being basically ripped off from double double charging or even triple charging in terms of in, in, in terms of um, in terms of costs and in terms of copyright as well. Of course, too has been another aspect there. 
So I think that I do know that with, in terms of Coalition S and Plan S, that they are working with publishers on this, both in all disciplines, because the, the Plan S uh, funders cover all areas as well. And, um, and, and they are working closely with, 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 with the publishers to find ways of how can you do this, especially in a sustainable manner for open access journals and publications. The other aspect of open access is um, in terms of data. And uh, the question often arises then, well, should all data be open immediately? Well, there's a number of reasons why it probably shouldn't. Um, and there should be periods when it's not open, because if you're a small research team working on data and you've got some really, really good results, you actually want time to exploit that data, to, you know, to write your publications, to really look at it and see, well, what, 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 can you, what can you get out of this data? If you make that open very quickly, you're going to open it up to every research team in the world who can easily, you know, have, especially if you're a small team, you've got very large teams globally, they can, they can scoop you very quickly with really high quality publications. The other issues are around commercial sensitivity. If you're working with uh, commercial partners who want to say, well, we don't want this data out now. And, um, and the same with where it's personal data and health data. You've got to be sensitive about how, how that's done. But I think that um, they are all, I do know these things are all part of the development and discussion. And I think it comes back to that point I made, was that you start off with the principle being open and then you find reasons to close rather than the way it's been around before, which has been everything's closed and then you have to push to make it open again. Okay, um, thank you. There's a, there's a couple of follow-ups from Daniel. Um, so I don't know if, the, if they've been covered. So Daniel, I'm just gonna ask them <laughs> to Connor as well. Um, he mentions that there, there are differential rates of publication uh, between STEM and non-STEM disciplines. And I think also within STEM. Um, so if there's, a, if there's a, as he says, a quantum of funding available to support open access publishing, either nationally or within institutions, how do we make sure that allocations are fair? And that's well, a that's fair a, with a small FAIR. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's not a question I can answer myself, but, but I think it's something which, I, I, I think the way to deal with something like that is to bring it, is to bring it into the open environment to make it clear what the differences are and to make that clarity of difference between the humanities, for example, where it can be very costly to publish and in some other scientific disciplines where it may be less so. But it's, uh, but even again, as I, as I mentioned, it's not, it's not purely that, that distinction between these two camps, even within the, the, the science camp, there are areas where, which are simply they are not. They don't. They are not well funded by the by, by the usual sort of uh, the large funders. The Science Foundations Ireland of this world do not fund these particular areas, and they find it hard to publish as well. But I do. I, I do agree, and I'm not. A, I, I really am not an expert in this area, so I I hesitate to say much further on it. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, the next question that we have is from Sandra Collins, who is the uh, the the contact point, the coordinator of the Research Data Ireland node and she asks what can librarians or repository slash archive people do to help achieve open science what do you see coming out of that sector and that skill set well i think and i i think this is one of for, for me it's one of the most interesting things is that um libraries had had sort of for, for a long time faded away in the scientific world in a sense in terms of people working in sciences i mean uh, you know you didn't need to go to the library anymore to actually access journals or, or books or anything like that. You could look at everything online. Um, although I must say, I always found that sitting in the library looking at stuff was great because you always came across things you weren't looking for, which were really, really interesting. But I think now that this has come back, the library has come back to center stage, I think, especially in the whole area of data stewardship. And I think this is an area for real expansion within universities in terms of how libraries will, 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 will put the, the role they will play into the future. Because while when you're looking at it in terms of how data is, is curated, stored and looked after within institutions, you will need, uh, and, and indeed, I, I, I think it's, um, I'm trying to remember which university it is in the Netherlands, I think it's Utrecht, and they have, um, they have assigned data stewards to every, every faculty of, uh, where, where you need people with a particular disciplinary expertise. But that is all coordinated out of the library as the core point for, for, for holding the data and the information as the main, as the main repository in the library itself. And uh, I mean, and even if we go back in time in Ireland, if we go back to the launch of RIAN, um, which was back in, I think it's 2009 when that was launched, 
that was the libraries who, who were involved in, in that whole process in terms of, of opening the access to publications. So I do think that looking forward, that the libraries will actually take on a new role and uh, I'm, 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 it's not new at this stage for many of you, but actually a far, a, a far stronger role in this regard within the institution. And I think as well, I, I, the way I would look at it too is, there's a lot of money that has gone through the library to the publishers. But perhaps in the future, if one sees that money doesn't have to go through the library, maybe you could stop in the library. Maybe there's a good argument for libraries to be pushing and saying, hang on, you know, before we had to spend this money to get access to these publications, now we're running open access, but we need resources because you know, libraries will need resources to do this. And these things are not, they're, they're certainly not cheap in capital in, or even in running in, uh, costs in terms of actually hiring people and keeping them there long term. Yeah, actually, there's another question that, that fits perfectly on this discussion point, and it's from John Cox, who's the head librarian at NUIG, um, and also uh, someone quite involved in, in the open science landscape himself. He's published a few interesting things on that. Um, I've added that. He didn't write that about himself. <laughs> so John asks um, a very pointed question, I think. Are researchers willing to lose access to journals for whatever length of time in order to force publishers to support open access? What do you think of that? I, or maybe comment on that. Comment on it. Um, well, I know I would, but I mean that's that, that's personally speaking. Um, I think you, yes, I think you get some kickback from from and pushback from from researchers on this. People say they can't live without their access to whatever journal it may be, whether it's Nature, or PhysRev, or Cell, or whatever, whatever particular one it is. But you're seeing already that. Um, that this has, um, that one of the interesting things is going back to that, one of those slides I showed you there earlier on was the um, the one from the 79 people from the editor, from the board of uh, the journal Neuron, the, it's an Elsevier publication. And one of their arguments was that their colleagues I've lost your voice, but I'm not sure if others have. Yes. Connor, I think we've lost your sound. I think you may have lost sound. Yeah. We've got a great system in place. It all works. And it's a bit like, you know, let's not, let's, let, let's not, let, let's not change it. And, uh, and there are those who will be very willing, and I'd say, you know, be very willing to say, no, no, let's go through a bit of pain for the, for the long-term gain that we will get from having open access. But I do okay. think that what's, what would really help it, of course, is the external force of, of, um, of, uh, pl of, of Plan S, for example, is gonna be a real driver of this change. Um, we lost a little bit of what you said in the middle there, but, um, but I think we, 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 you rounded it off at the end. Sorry that the, the sound just went silent. Um, but I'll okay. move on to the next question. Uh, this comes from Paula Osset. Um, and uh, the question is, ideally, the open science principles should be promoted at early career stages. And there's a couple of other questions around what can we do for early career researchers. Um, but she says, but younger PhDs seem to be risking more by adopting them. How can we solve this? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree fully with that. Absolutely. That is um, the, the only way that will change is um, the, the, the only way I think that that will drive the change quickly will be funders, that funders will change how they review people. Now, I do know that here the Health Research Board have already started doing this. They have what they call the Early Investigator Award. Mm -hmm. And it's for people who, now the, what you're looking at here are people who are kind of betwixt and between dependent and independent researchers. They're becoming, they're moving from dependent researcher to independent researcher. And they have brought in these broader assessment criteria to move away from the journal impact factor and that as well that would that certainly will embrace open science and open open access publications in that regard but until one sees that for example um the way i see that really happening is and this is something which we, we, will be happening in horizon europe is that this will be piloted you know look, to see this piloted with, with with parts of the evaluation in horizon europe for example with the european research council that you start changing how you evaluate research. If you change how you evaluate researchers, then that changes how this is done. That changes that aspect. 
It also changes as well. If nature goes from closed access to open access, then people can start to, th that changes how it, it, it's viewed as a journal. So it, it, it's, it, 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 right now, if I was a PhD or even a postdoc, I would have no interest in doing this, simple as that, because I know that if I want, if, if I want my postdoc grant, if I want to get my next grant as a postdoc, um, I'm not, unless I publish in the high impact journals in my discipline, I'm not going to make it right now. So right now it's difficult, I, I agree fully. And it is up to funders, but also institutions, universities, to look to changing how they are recruiting people and how they are progressing people in their careers as well on this. Yeah, there seems to be, um, there's kind of a, a hump we have to get over, and it's the question of yeah. how to do that at the moment, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, oh, a couple more questions coming in. Are we good to keep, to ask you a couple more? We, so, you're, getting some very, you're getting very big ones that are unanswerable in the moment, but I appreciate your effort to try to respond That's to right. them. Um, so Luke, Luke Drury, who is from Dias and also he's on the board of well. All European, yeah, <laughs> um, you know him, I'm sure, has asked any comment on the value of DORA, the San Francisco Declaration? Yeah, I think, well, I, I think the one comment I'll make on DORA is that, um, as, as Luke well knows, the problem, one of the problems with DORA is that many institutions have signed it and say, oh yes, we'd sign that, but they don't actually implement it. And uh, now we are seeing universities in Europe, a number of universities doing it in a very, in a very, in a very public manner. But um, until one sees um, far wider, you know, you're not going to see a better impact if, if, if institutions simply sign up to something like DOOR, but don't actually take the next steps in terms of implementation. I would hope that um, the the changes that are coming in terms of Plan S and Horizon Europe will, will start driving these, these types of institutional changes. They've certainly done it in the past. When you look at what, what happened with European funding, how it changed directions in terms of types of research and that. And um, I mean, a, a one good, I mean, I give one good, there, there are two good examples. And one is the, um, one is the Mary Skłodowska Curie Actions, which have been funded by the Commission for, for every framework program since, since the foundation of the framework programs in the 80s. And um, they have, you can see in national programs, how national programs have changed to adopt the principles, adopt the methodologies, adopt what they do in those programs. So when those programs change their, their methods, and the ERC the same has brought around a lot of change in national funding programs as well to make people more competitive in that regard. Um, I would hope that um, those kind of changes will push institutions more to actually implement DORA rather than simply signing it and, and, and just putting it to one side so as they can say they've done it. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I think we have uh, one final question for you. And you you had mentioned some of the efforts in the Netherlands. Um, I think it, it may be more than one university. The the one I know is TU Delft that put in the data stewards uh, into place. But anyway, this is from Sander Bosch, who's the Open Science Coordinator at VU Amsterdam. Um, and the question is, how do you see the role of publishers? So you've spoke you've, you've spoken about publishers, but how do you see the role of publishers in the future landscape of scholarly communication? Will they still have a central role, or do you think the implementation of open research practices will diminish the importance of their role? I think that um, I'm, I'm, I think nature is going to be a good example of, of, of how this of how this actually evolves over time. At the moment, I mean, you, you can see there are there are a number of camps. I mean, there's the Elsevier camp, which simply says, "No, we're not going to do it," and come hell or high water. And um, if, if, if you look at over the last couple of years that actually Elsevier have been, what, what, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're buying up all these various types of companies that are involved in data analysis and that. So what, what publishers are going to look at and say, if your business model changes, so if, 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 if you make your money from publishing, you know, publishing articles and you're suddenly going to find that revenue stream is going to dry up, then you look to see, well, what else can we do? Where can we provide value? Nature's approach has been that um, they will provide value in terms of the work they do, where they take information, they analyze, they, 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 I mean, Nature actually does actually produce excellent information, excellent articles on things like, for example, around um, evolution of the PhD globally. And you find out they, they, 
we may know a lot about what goes on in Europe and that, but they'll actually have information from Africa, from Asia, from other parts of the world. And they're going to start looking at developing these aspects. They will start looking at developing more about data analysis, bibliometrics and that as well around publications, because that's where they think they can actually generate revenue in those, in, in those areas. Um, but the um, for, the, for the large, I mean, I, I don't know what it will be with the very large publishers, because if if the trend continues in, the, in, in this direction, one is going to see that um, they're not going to have clients. If people move to, if you see say Springer, you know, nature uh, is moving open, is moving to open access, then people will, will, will migrate to those areas, they'll migrate to those journals and, and they leave those publish, publishers that don't change their business model will, will definitely fade away. Well, look, I want to thank you very much. You've given us a, an extremely comprehensive, almost encyclopedic overview of the origins of open science and, and what, you know, historically has been a precursor to what we're facing right now, which is, um, I think, a really revolutionary moment in the way that research is conducted and shared and communicated. Um, and this, this was a really excellent overview. So, um, and also, you know, um, you did a great job of asking the tough questions um, that are that are difficult to answer at this point. So thank you so much. I know that we we had been um, very excitedly trying to get you to speak in this series for some time. Um, so you know the fact that you you cannot fly to Brussels for the millions of meetings that you have to means that we you know were able to nail you down in an online webinar. So thank you so much again, Dr. Connor O'Carroll, for this. Um, and. Uh, I, I just might say a few things now about the rest of this series and um, and Research Data Alliance. But um, Before you yeah. do, Natalie, just, just to say thank you for the invitation and, and thank you everybody who participated and joined in. Um, it's, 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 it's a lot more challenging, I think, to stay online and watch these things. I know I've done it myself, but, but I do appreciate everybody, everybody who's been involved. Thank you. Well, you're a very engaging speaker, um, so thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so I'll just share um, a couple of things here. I might post these links also in the chat if I can. I hope that I'm in the right window. Um, there we go. So these are some of the links. I've put them in the chat as well. Um, so what you were just part of today is um, the RDA Ireland Meet the Experts series. As I said, we've now had six talks in, in that series. Um, the Research Data Alliance, for those of you that aren't familiar, is a global uh, uh, network and association that is dedicated to uh, kind of removing the social and technical barriers for sharing research data. And I think there's over 10,000 members at this point. Um, and then um, what is what has been created is a kind of national node structure within Europe, supported by the European Commission's investment into RDA. And the National Library of Ireland is the Irish node for the Research Data Alliance. Uh, and then we at the Digital Repository of Ireland help support that national node um, by pitching in on uh, things like this Meet the Experts series. So there's a link there for the Research Data Alliance Ireland. If you'd like to um, learn more about it or sign up, you can just sign up for RDA as a member. It's free. It's just a, you know, a login to the website. Um, there's quite a bit going on. We have a series of spotlights on uh, different Irish researchers and uh, research support people that are working in this area that you can see uh, links from that page. Um, Connor mentioned the RDA COVID-19 working group, which was, I was very um, pleased that he uh, mentioned that because that's been a rapid response working group. There's a link there to that if you want to see what um, what's happening uh, and get involved. But the idea there is to create um, globally adoptable principles for sharing COVID-19 data rapidly and efficiently. Um, and to just uh, finalize this, I'd like to say that we, we actually have another Meet the Expert series webinar this Friday uh, at 1 p.m. And that will be Rebecca Grant, and she'll be talking specifically about research data in Ireland. Um, she's been doing her PhD on this, and she's also working in the area outside of Ireland right now. So there's a link there if you want to sign up for that. Um, I think that's everything that I had to say to finish this. So thank you so much for attending and I believe we'll make this webinar recording available and um, I hope to see you the next time. Thanks for signing in.